Well, I have 6.30 here on my computer and I still have quite a few people trying to get in and that's wonderful. So I will keep everybody muted. And if you have a question, by all means, you know, either put it in the chat and, and I love seeing where y'all are from. That, that is, that just is amazing. So for those who haven't put in where you're from, go ahead and put that in. And so you can write a question in chat and I will interrupt David and, or you can raise your hand and ask him a question. And then at the end, we'll have a, just a general question and answering session where you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask questions of David to your heart's content. So David Lewis, Dr. David Lewis, he has started beekeeping in 2014 with my first Wyoming Bee College Conference in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And he has consumed more beekeeping information books and magazines and knowledge than anybody I've ever met. He's also taught for me at the Bee College. He has a mentoring beekeepers group and he has reached out to other groups in the state to help them out. And he is uh, a, one of my go-to people when I have questions or if there's a swarm and he's available, I send him out to fetch that swarm. So he's got a wealth of information and we will learn a lot about um, different breeds of bees tonight, different honeybees. And by all means, you don't have to limit your questions to him about just just different types of bees. And with that, David, if there's anything else you need to add to that introduction, go ahead. And oh. my last caveat is it's being, this is being recorded. I will put the link in the chat box so that you can pick it up later if you miss anything or wanna rewatch it. So um, everybody welcome to the Wyoming Bee College Conference Speaker Series done online via Zoom. And we'll continue these through February, March. And then um, after um, the 20th of March, then I'm gonna start working more on advanced beekeeping topics. So we're gonna kind of do the basics here and then we'll, we'll move on to bigger and better topics. So David, sorry, um, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Catherine. So um, I've been keeping bees for six years in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I used to think that Cheyenne was a pretty challenging place to try to keep your bees alive, particularly over the winter, but I find that everywhere is challenging to keep your bees alive. And I'm very happy to have folks looking in from so many different, uh, different places. There are challenges for beekeeping no matter where you live. Uh, we're enjoying a cold snap, the Siberian Express, uh, coming through the Midwest here this week. But uh, it's still not too early to start thinking about maybe getting some more bees this coming spring. And this talk is probably uh, most uh, useful to uh, new newcomers, folks who may not have bought bees before. Uh, I'm going to talk about the varieties of bees, but mostly the ones that are commercially available here in the U.S. Um, if uh, we have some more experienced beekeepers, I would really welcome your chiming in. If you have some experience with the breeds of bees I'm talking about, please uh, share that. Uh, it's always more useful to have uh, practical information. I can give some of the a theory, discuss some of the characteristics or at least the reputation of different breeds of bees. Uh, but if you've been a beekeeper and you've had Russians or Cardiolans or Caucasian bees, uh, please tell us what you, uh, what you learned about them. Um, what we're talking about are the Western uh, honeybee. Um, and that is, let's go to the first slide here. Whoops, I'm going to have to have a real light touch to make this thing work uh, in order to advance the slides and not jump too far ahead. Let's try this. The Western honeybee or European honeybee, uh, the Latin name is uh, Apis mellifera. And uh, th these are uh, bees that originally uh, probably came from the Mideast, but they spread into uh, Europe and Africa and then were brought over to the US. The uh, United States does not have any native honeybees. 
all the bees that we have are bees that were imported, that were brought across uh, from, from other countries. And some of them escaped from captivity and uh, are now feral honeybees or wild honeybees, but they're not native uh, to, to our country. Um, Apis mellifera, the Western honeybee, was actually named by Linnaeus. Linnaeus is the um, person who invented the binomial way of naming uh, organisms by their genus and species. And uh, Apis is the genus of bees and the Western honeybee he named mellifera. Well, that's the honey carrying or ferrying, the honey, honey ferrying bee. Um, and Linnaeus realized after a little bit that honeybees don't usually carry honey. They're usually carrying nectar and pollen. They make honey. And so he tried to change the name. Uh, he tried to make it the honey-making bee instead of the honey-ferrying bee or the honey-carrying bee and suggested that it should be Apis mellifica instead of Apis mellifera. But the name had already caught on. That was the uh, primary name in the uh, nomenclature. And so that is the name that has stuck. Uh, so the bees that we're talking about are bees that spread from the Mideast into Europe and then got imported here into the, the U.S. Um, when we talk about breeds of bees, it's very much like breeds of dogs. Uh, all of the bees I'll be talking about are in the same species, Apis mellifera, but they differ somewhat in their appearance. Most of them are able to interbreed with one another. Um, and therefore, we're really talking about varieties or subspecies or breeds within one species. Now, there are quite a number of varieties of dogs. Um, and if I were to ask you what's the very best breed of dog, I'd probably get a lot of different answers um, and maybe start a few arguments and maybe start a few fistfights. I'm kind of partial to golden retrievers, but my sister is very fond of dachshunds. And I think most of my friends have some preference or another. Mostly when you try to look at a breed of dog, you're looking at their reputation for certain characteristics. So golden retrievers are uh, affectionate. Irish setters are uh, excitable. Uh, sheep dogs are smart. And we sort of have these ideas that there are qualities and characteristics that go along with the individual varieties of dogs. That's their reputation. But anytime you start to talk to a group about dogs, there's someone who will say, well, I had a golden retriever and he wasn't affectionate at all. He was the meanest dog I ever saw and he bit everybody in sight because that's their experience with that, that particular individual. So I'm going to talk a little bit about breeds of bees, but the fact is your experience with particular uh, colonies of bees might be quite different. Uh, there are probably some characteristics that go along with the genetics that have defined uh, the different bee breeds, um, but there's also individual variation, um, and that just makes beekeeping that much more interesting. Um, when we're looking at bee breeds, there are some characteristics that we might like to try to uh, inbreed into the lineage of the bees that we have. And these uh, would be true for a whole variety of, of bees, but some varieties might favor one characteristic over another. Uh, many people would like to have bees that make a lot of honey, and that implies that they're pretty good foragers. Uh, bees that are gentle, not aggressive, don't get too excited, allow you to open the hive without uh, boiling up out and challenging, uh, challenging you. Um, some people, particularly those who uh, are interested in bees for pollination, want bees that build up pretty rapidly in the spring so that by the time the almonds are in bloom, they will have fairly populous colonies that they can use for uh, pollination. Um, other folks like a steady growth of the colony pretty much throughout the season so that there isn't a drop off in the queen's production of new bees, say in the summertime. Um, propolis is actually a very useful compound in the hive. And there are some folks who think that we really shouldn't 
try to select bees who don't make propolis because it has uh, antibacterial or antiviral properties, but it also makes the, the hive very sticky, it makes it hard to get the frames out. You, know, you may have to do a lot of uh, pounding and, and cutting. And so over time, uh, beekeepers have tended to select uh, bees that don't make a lot of propolis. Um, of course, resistance to diseases is a very important quality in bees, particularly nowadays. So resistance to varroa mites, kind of some couple of decades back, it was resistance to tracheal mites, resistance to brood diseases like uh, American fowl brood, European fowl brood, and resistance to viral diseases. Those are all desirable qualities that we would like to encourage in the lineage of our bees. And uh, diminished swarming, um, and again, there's a little controversy here because there are some advantages in colonies that swarm. They, they interrupt the brood rearing and that can help with mite control. But in general, uh, beekeepers have tried to breed bees that are not going to swarm a great deal because they lose a good portion of their colony every time that happens. There are also some undesirable characteristics. Um, aggressiveness, uh, bees that uh, are very defensive, um, and uh, do not uh, permit activities to occur around, around the hives. Uh, some bees have a tendency to supersede the queen that replaces an older queen with the younger queen, which might be good, but if you have purchased an expensive queen with very nice genetics, you pre probably don't want your bees uh, choosing to get rid of her and raise their own queen who may not have those favorable characteristics. Uh, some uh, colonies of bees are prone to absconding. Absconding means that the whole colony just leaves the, the space that they're in and goes to seek a new space. It's not quite swarming because the colony doesn't split. They just take off for greener pastures. And of course, you don't want your, your bees doing that. Swarming, where the colony splits and a portion of the colony goes to seek a new residence. Uh, leaves you with about half or fewer bees than you started with before the swarm occurred. Uh, robbing is uh, where one colony of bees discovers that another colony has stored honey and they go and get that rather than going out and collecting nectar and making their own honey. And if that happens in your bee yard, the bees are moving the honey around from one of your hives to another, but they're not out collecting the nectar that they would need to make, make more honey and it causes the bees to become very uh, defensive. So we'd prefer bees that don't, uh, don't rob as much. And again, production of propolis. Now, some uh, breeds of bees tend to delay the spring buildup, which in certain climates where there's not much uh, nectar or pollen in the spring, particularly variable cold weather, that might be an advantage but in general, we are particularly, again, those folks who are earning their money through pollination would like to have a rapid buildup of their colonies in spring. So they have very populous hives when the pollination season arrives. Uh, here are some of the, the breeds we'll be talking about. These are common ones. If you uh, look online or if you read the bee magazines, you'll see advertisements from bee breeders who uh, can provide these different varieties. The most common one in the US is Italian. Uh, we also have Carniolans. A lot of people have trouble with that word. It's, it's not Carolingian, it's not uh, Carnolian, it's Carni, like a fellow who works at the carnival. Carniolan, uh, Caucasian uh, bees, Russian uh, bees, and then there are uh, several others that are available if you, you look for them. Uh, Saskatraz, Minnesota Hygienic, VSH stands for Varroa Sensitive Hygiene and is one of the uh, more Varroa resistant or attempts to breed a Varroa resistant bee. And then there are hybrids and I'll talk a little bit about what we mean when we say the word hybrid to refer to a, a lineage of bees. So here is the most common bee. This is Apis mellifera, that's the Western honeybee. Ligustica refers to the Italian honeybee. And I would say if this honeybee were the size of a small dog, we'd probably have some Hollywood celebrities walking them around on leashes because this is just a beautiful bee. Look at that, that bee with the golden ruffle and the gold body. Uh, this is just a lovely little animal. 
And these are the ones that you will usually find. Oops, I'm skipping ahead too fast. Let me back up just a little bit here. And I'm heavy handed. Okay, the Italian bees have been interacting. They certainly have been uh, living uh, close to human domiciles for many centuries. And in that time, they have been selected for a number of positive qualities. Um, Italian queens are often quite uh, productive, pretty steady at uh, laying eggs and hatching young. They are thought to be very good honey producers. That is in part because they're good foragers. Uh, they are able to find nectar resources in their area um, to a great degree and exploit those. They have been bred for uh, gentleness and lack of aggression. And I can say that my first bees were Italian bees and they were extremely patient with me. I would go out and bumble around in the, with the hive. My dog would run out and, and his tail, wagging tail would bang on the hive, bang, 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 bang. And the bees just went about their business on the comb. They didn't get too excited. They didn't see, uh, get, they call it runny on the comb where the bees are excited and running all around. They just calmly went about their business and ignored that idiot who was walking around in that white suit and bothering them. Uh, so uh, I think that Italians are generally very good natured. Um, they have tried to breed out the instinct to swarm they don't make as much propolis as other uh, breeds of bees. Uh, they're fairly hygienic in cleaning the hive. And it is said that Italian bees have a pretty steady uh, buildup of bees right along through the, the beekeeping season. Uh, not especially fast early in the spring, but pretty steady throughout the year. Now, they do have a tendency to rob, and I think that may very well just go along with their being good foragers. They are good at finding resources, and sometimes those resources are in a neighboring hive, which makes this particular group a little bit more prone to, to robbing. Um, but in general, uh, these are the most common bees in the US, and I think there's a good reason for that. Uh, if you're just starting out, Italian bees might be a very good choice. Sometimes you'll see advertisements for Cordovan bees. Now, Cordovan bees have a particular golden yellow color that bee fanciers uh, like a good deal. These are still Italian bees, um, but they uh, have this uh, pale and bright uh, yellow appearance. And that turns out to be a recessive trait, which is not unique to the Italian species, subspecies. This is uh, true for, uh, can be found in, in other uh, varieties of Western honeybees as well. Um, the, Interesting thing about this is that if you are, have bred your bees for the Cordovan trait, you have bees that have two recessive genes in order to express that gold color. And if you are trying to keep your bloodline pure and wild drones mate with one of your queens, the golden color will disappear because a more dominant color gene will come in from the wild bees. So uh, folks who are breeding bees who may not have access to pure genetic analysis can kind of follow their breeding program if the bees have the double recessive Cordovan trait. Um, and therefore it was helpful in seeing to it that uh, the, so your bees you were selecting for were not being diluted by wild type genes coming in from wild drones. Controlling the genetics of bees is really tough because the queen mates with one or two dozen males uh, 300 feet in the air. And it's just very difficult uh, to be sure that your queen is not mating outside of your breeding program and bringing in some wild type uh, genes that may or may not be desirable. Um, so uh, you may uh, see some folks who really like the Cordovan, the, the bright gold Cordovan bees. That's just another variety in, in uh, this case of Italian bees, but you can find the Cordovan traits in other uh, bees as well. Well, fast bees are also a, a variety that comes with an Italian lineage. Uh, Buckfast is the name of an abbey in Britain. Hey, David? There was, yes. David, uh, I just want a, a question for you. You know, we just talked about the, the Cordovian Italian Cordova. bees. And you said they uh, have a mating flight at 300 feet in the air. That's typical for queens. 
Oh, uh, doesn't that make them bird food? Well, yes, but that's that's the way the queens are. The queens, uh, the virgin queen leaves the, the hive, uh, flies high into the air, and there are drone congregation areas or ECAs. You know, uh, honeybee drones have a pretty good life. It's said that they sit around with their cigars and their remotes and just wait for the queen to come flying by. Um, so the the queen generally does move some distance away from the hive, not directly over the hive, but she's very high, she's high in the sky, and the drones will see that the queen is on a mating flight and will form a comet tail around her, racing to be the first to be able to mate. Unfortunately for the male bee, mating is fatal. Um, the, the bee basically tears himself apart in the act of mating. Um, and uh, the queen then uh, continues over the course of a week or two to mate with up to maybe two dozen different males, storing all the sperm. And then she has all the sperm she needs to lay either fertile or infertile eggs for the rest of her lifetime, which can be several years. Thank you. <laughs> um, Buckfast uh, uh, variety of bees was developed by uh, Brother Adam, who is a monk who was at the Buckfast Abbey. And he was trying to breed bees that would be particularly uh, adapted to a fairly damp, cool climate in Britain. Uh, he got Italian honeybees, but he interbred them with feral native bees. And those probably were European black bees. I'll have a couple of pictures of those later on. But he selected uh, traits on the Buckfast bees and he was quite successful in selecting useful, useful traits. Buckfast bees have a number of uh, advocates who think that he did a very good job with them. Um, they are mostly Italian and native British bees, but he brought in some, some other genetic lines as well. Uh, the, the problem has been that uh, if you purchase Buckfast queens, they are likely to mate with non-Buckfast bees in your area, either from your other hives or from other beekeepers or from feral bees. And this tends to dilute the characteristics that were selected for the buckfast bees. So it may be that in order to keep the buckfast genetics uh, steady in your colonies, you need to keep requeening with bees that are specifically bred from the buckfast line. Brother Adam was also an author and he has a number of interesting books, including he was quite interested in mead making. And I know we've got some mead fans uh, here. Um, so he has uh, beekeeping at Buckfast Alley with a sect uh, Buck Buckfast Abbey with a section on uh, mead making and also uh, talking about his breeding program. Unfortunately, some folks who, uh, some, some commercial breeders got hold of Buckfast bees but they weren't very careful to control their drones. And therefore the Buckfast bees really didn't have the qualities that were part of the original Buckfast line and people have nicknamed those fast buck bees. Because they really do not have all of the, the Buckfast qualities. It is interesting that when the Bee Informed Partnership began to take surveys of um, winter mortality, which they did I think starting about two to three years ago, of their first year's reports from all over the country, the absolute lowest winter mortality was in the Buckfast bees. I don't know that that was a very large sample, but it was interesting that in their reports, that was the variety that had the best, best overwintering. Developed by Brother, um, Brother Adam, rapid spring buildup, selected for gentleness and low tendency to swarm. Uh, get through the winter without requiring large winter stores. So for damp and cold areas, they may be a good choice. Uh, produce honey, and that's the Italian lineage, but are inclined to rob, similar to the Italian bees. Here is the Carniolan bee. Uh, this bee also comes from uh, the northern shore of the Mediterranean. Uh, is similarly to, to Italian bees. They are a little bit more gray or brown. They're not quite as golden in color as the uh, Italian bees. 
they are uh, gentle, and their fame is that they do well in the wintertime, which for us in Wyoming and probably you folks up in Canada is an attractive uh, trait. They don't make a lot of propolis, and they do have a rapid spring buildup, which is favored by the folks who will need to get their hives, uh, their colonies going fast early in the spring for pollination services. Uh, it is said that the Carniolids have a summer lull. The queens uh, will not be laying quite as much in the midsummer as, say, the Italian queens do. Um, they don't have the reputation for robbing as much as the Italians do, but because of perhaps because of the rapid spring buildup, they may have a greater tendency to swarm than the Italian bees. Now, this slide is from a UK Beekeepers Association. Uh, I borrowed it from them. And it says they're not as productive as Italians, but those are fighting words among folks who favor Carniolans. I think many people think that uh, the Carniolans do just about as well as the Italians in terms of overall honey production. Um, so Carniolans are not as popular as Italians, but here in Wyoming, I think they have a, a group of fans and, and advocates. Um, after my first year with Italians, I got uh, Carniolans and they have fared fairly well. Although I kill a lot of bees, uh, uh, overwintering in, in uh, Wyoming is, is tough, um, but uh, Carniolans seem to do uh, fairly well in harsh winter conditions. There is a brand name, which you will see advertised in uh, the uh, bee magazines called the New World Carniolan. New World Carniolan is a trademark, and in Ohio State, uh, Sue Kobe is a very well-known uh, beekeeper and an advocate of artificial insemination to control the genetic lines of bees. And she goes around the country teaching workshops on artificial insemination of honeybees. At Ohio State University, they began a selective breeding program to try to improve the line of the basic carniolan variety. And they have been selecting and refining their stock they then provide the stock to uh, licensed queen breeders to propagate uh, their, their genetics and then uh, provide queens to the public. So uh, if you see the designation New World Carniolan, that implies that the bee breeder has made an arrangement with Ohio State University to take advantage of their genetic selection of Carniolan bees. They are still part of the same basic lineage uh, of these bees from Northern Europe, but this university has been working over a number of years to try to refine the characteristics of that line. So that's what a new world carniolum is. Hey, David, I have a question for you. So do you, have you kept track of your loss ratios between Italians versus carniolans? I have not, and that's because I had two colonies of Italians my first year, and they uh, were in uninsulated and, in fact, open uh, mesh bottomed hives when the first snowfall came. And so my first two colonies of Italians died in the early fall through no fault of their own. This was entirely, uh, we say that the greatest danger to the honeybees in, in the, our contemporary world, it's not viruses and not mites, uh, it's not weather, it's beekeepers. <laughs> and I was an inexperienced beekeeper and I was not prepared for winter and neither were my bees. Um, so I, I don't know that, uh, you know, unless conditions are very equal and beekeepers are equally skilled from year to year, if uh, keeping statistics on which bees survived would be terribly helpful. Um, I think that uh, it, from what I have heard from other beekeepers, Italians and Carniolans do just fine. Uh, it just, it's a little bit like asking which kind of hive is best in Wyoming. And in fact, people are successful with vertical hives, horizontal hives, hot bar hives, worry hives. Um, they, all of those can indeed keep your bees alive through the, through the winter. And I think either breed of bee is capable of surviving in Wyoming. So, David, a couple more questions for you. Sure. One, um, do Italian bees tend to go straight up in the hive and not fill up the sides? And then the second question is, 
are there special measures one can employ to help bees survive the winter? So we're getting a little off topic on that <laughs> one, but um, um, that's what tonight's all about. Yep. Um, the first question is an interesting one. Um, there have been, uh, Langstroth definitely believed that bees like to move upward in the hive. And his bees apparently cooperated with that. So if you were very quick to say, put your bees in a three deep hive with frames in each box, you might find that the bees moved up to the top box before they filled out the lower boxes. And Langstroth believed the queen didn't like to go back down once she had gone up. And therefore beekeepers in the Langstroth system will sometimes do spring reversal in which they take uh, the lower box that the queen has moved out of and move it on top of the box that the queen is in. And they may do that every week or 10 days for several weeks in the spring in order to keep a relatively empty box on top and give the queen room to move upward. It's interesting that Warre, Abne Warre in Europe, who invented the Warre hive and was very interested in popularizing beekeeping, added his extra boxes underneath and I think he probably had a couple of hefty acolytes to lift the hive up in order for him to get that box under there. Although the Warre hive is a little smaller than the Langstroth hive, it could get pretty heavy. But he believed that bees moved down, which he would argue is what they do in nature when they build combs suspended from the top of a cavity that the general expansion of uh, the bee colony is downward, not upward. So we've got an American who says the bees like to move up. We've got a European who says the bees like to move down. My own opinion is that bees accommodate themselves to the space available to them. Some people have criticized horizontal hives saying the bees don't like to move laterally. They like to go vertically up and down. And then there are folks who say, well, I had a, a colony of bees take up residence in under my floor between the joists and they built a uh, set of combs that went 10 feet in under the floor uh, in, you know, in the sub-basement. Uh, they were perfectly happy building horizontally in this situation because that's the space that was available to them. I think these are very adaptable and I can't say from my own experience that one breed is more vertically oriented than another. I'm afraid the overwintering question is an entire uh, probably two part, two part lecture on what one can do to help the bees over winter. The general notion is going that you prepare for winter starting almost the, 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 er, the previous spring. And uh, I was very sorry to hear that because I started reading, what shall I do in July and August to um, get my bees through the winter? And it said, well, you should have started several months ago. Um, the basic notion is you would like to have as healthy a hive as possible, which means low mite counts and diminished amounts of treatable diseases. You need a healthy fertile queen who will continue to lay and start to lay brood in the late winter when brood rearing, the interruption of brood rearing is over. Um, you uh, need a ample supply of food stores that's both protein and carbohydrate, both pollen and nectar. Um, the actual physical uh, hive may not be as important as we tend to think it is. When human beings think about overwintering, we think about our domicile. We want to uh, weatherproof the cracks so that cold air doesn't get in. We want to warm the inside of our, our house. Um, we do a lot of things to the building that we're in uh, we don't say winter's coming, I better get to the gym and get in the best possible shape to get through the winter. Uh, but honeybees, uh, their physical environment may be less important than the actual health of the bees in the colony, their ability to cluster and generate heat and having enough uh, stores to be able to get them through the winter. But I'm getting off into some pretty controversial areas here. We should have another talk about overwintering sometime later on in the year. Thank you, David. <laughs> You're right. Uh, the, the whole wintering thing, that is another program. And at the Bee College, I'll usually have what, like two or three 
sections just on overwintering because it's, sure. it's one of our biggest problems. Even the commercial uh, bee beekeepers are suffering losses in the winter of 30 to 40 percent, not that much lower than the hobbyist and sideliner beekeepers. So it's a problem for everybody trying to get bees through the winter. Here's another uh, breed, and bees take a little bit of looking for, but there are uh, fanciers of Caucasian honeybees, and you will see uh, breeders advertising in the bee magazines. And if you are interested in these bees, these are also a rather grayish bee, not quite as uh, golden as the Italian, maybe even a little darker uh, or grayer than the Carniolans. Um, they are very gentle, don't have a lot of swarming, their brood buildup is delayed, which in certain environments might be a good thing if there really isn't much pollen or nectar available in the spring. But in the US, for the most part, folks are looking for that early spring buildup. Uh, fairly good honey producers, but the knock on Caucasians is that they make a lot of propolis. As I said, propolis is not necessarily a bad thing. It's actually a, a good thing. Bees in hives that have uh, propolis coverings uh, over the surfaces of the, the inner surfaces of the hive are actually demonst demonstrably healthier than bees that do not. Um, but for the beekeeper, this can be a headache if you're trying to get into the hive and inspect it, uh, and get those frames up out of there, having everything glued together with a resinous propolis is a real, uh, real issue. Uh, colonies don't reach full strength until midsummer. Uh, high use of propolis makes the hive management a little more difficult. And according to uh, the, this uh, slideshow, uh, which again came from Britain, uh, the Caucasians were somewhat more susceptible to uh, nosema, um, and that made it, them more difficult to overwinter. Uh, one of the problems that overwintering, particularly in cold climates, is the bees may not be able to make cleansing flights during the winter time, and that does make them susceptible to dysentery and possibly to infection with nosema, which is an intestinal parasite of bees um, that can make them sick. And bees that uh, can't get out during the winter months and are basically trapped in the hive uh, are more susceptible to dysentery and possibly to nosema infections. Uh, nonetheless, I think there are folks in the US who are very happy with their Caucasian bees. They're just a little less common than the uh, Italians or the Carniolans. Ah, uh, Russian honeybees. Uh, Russian honeybees have a little bit of a bad, bad uh, reputation. Uh, they're uh, supposedly rather bad tempered and therefore uh, beginning beekeepers may tend to shy away from them. But uh, the Russian bees uh, have a geographic area that overlaps with the Eastern or Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, a different species of bee. And Varroa mites originated in Asia on the Apis serrana, the Asian bees. And they were able to move to the Western honeybees because Russian beehives in Eastern Russia were in the same geographic area as the Asian bees and the Asian mites. As a result of that, the Russian bees have been exposed to varroa mites for many, many generations, many more than the European bees, the Italians and the Cardiolans and the Caucasian bees. And it was very much hoped that they had some innate uh, resistance to varroa that had been naturally selected because they were surviving in regions where Varroa was present. Um, so when uh, Varroa uh, hit, that was in, I think 1986 was the big, it, it had been spotted in the US a little earlier, but the really big uh, identification of the Varroa mite came in, in 1986. Um, it spread very rapidly because we move our hives all over the country um, going to pollination sites. And so we moved Varroa everywhere and it kind of popped up almost everywhere at once. And it looked for a while like that might wipe out beekeeping in the US. So the uh, USDA, now as it happened uh, a decade or so earlier, there had been an outbreak of a different mite 
tracheolite, which came into the U.S. from Mexico. And again, at that time, there was doom and gloom that the beekeeping was at an end in America and the tracheomites were going to wipe out all the honeybees. Interestingly enough, uh, the, the honeybees in the U.S. developed resistance to the tracheomite very rapidly over a matter of just a few years. Um, so the tracheomites are still around, but they're not as great a threat as we, we thought they might be at the time. But because the tracheomite had come in from the hives coming up from Mexico, there was an embargo on the import of any honeybees shortly after the tracheomite infestation was discovered. And that embargo was still going on in 1986 when the varroa mites were discovered. It's actually thought that some bee breeders broke the embargo and snuck some bees in from foreign countries and brought the varroa mites with them because in theory, uh, no, bee, uh, no bees were to be imported at that time. Uh, then the USDA got in the act and they thought if these Russian bees have some innate resistance, we should get hold of Russian bee germplasm and begin a breeding program and see if we can't uh, bring those genetics in and essentially uh, hybridize them, interbreed the Russians with the existing Italian, Carniola, and European bees, and see if we can't develop resistant strains. So the USDA made a special arrangement to get hold of Russian uh, bee germplasm and began a breeding program um, to try to cr uh, create a more varroa tolerant or varroa resistant uh, breed. And that is the reputation that Russian bees have, resistant to varroa and tracheal mites. They are winter adapted and they seem to overwinter well, tendency to swarm. And at least uh, when, when these slides were made, which is probably some years ago, fairly expensive because they were limited, there were limited numbers of them available uh, in the UK and, and the US. A dark bee, more, more gray, uh, not as yellow. Uh, they don't make a whole lot of propolis. Winter hardiness can survive, uh, generate enough heat even with a smaller cluster to get through. Uh, not particularly tremendous honey producers, but uh, basically will, uh, will make honey. Um, some bees have been bred to try to uh, get resistance to brood diseases. Russian bees don't have a special resistance to AFB or EFB, the foul brood diseases. Um, but they do have some uh, degree of resistance to, to varroa. Um, so uh, the, the European honeybees way back a couple of centuries ago went, uh, were brought into Eastern Europe where they interacted with the Asian honeybees and their mites. Um, and therefore, they have had longer to be able to develop resistance than the European bees. Now, I have shied away. I've never kept Russians. I'd be interested if anybody has uh, some comments about uh, keeping Russian bees. Um, and the notion was that Russian bees are mean. Uh, now, some people actually believe that in selecting European bees for gentleness, we might have been selecting out the traits of aggressiveness toward the mites. They're interested in bees that tend to groom a lot and bite the mites when they find them. And people wondered if those bees being more aggressive to the mites would naturally also be more aggressive to intruders around their hives. So it's possible that in selecting for gentleness and a lack of excitability that we may have actually selected for bees that aren't quite as aggressive against the mites. Um, and that's a dilemma because I would uh, prefer to have gentle bees that are not going to sting me, but I would also like my bees to be able to survive varroa. Um, here is an experiment that was reported just a couple of months ago. Uh, Thomas Seeley is a very well-known national bee researcher. He uh, has a book called Honey Bee Democracy about how swarms determine which of several possible new homes, new cavities they will inhabit. Um, and it did some really fascinating and very clever experiments to try and determine how the decision-making process in the swarm goes on to allow the bees to pick one place. Uh, if you know swarms, after they leave their uh, parent hive, tend to bivouac out in the open, often on a branch, and stay there for 24 to 48 hours, 
sending out scouts to find a more suitable permanent accommodation. And uh, how the scouts go out, to find spots, come back, report to the group, and how the group makes a decision as to what, uh, which one of several possible living spaces they will try to inhabit is the subject of this book. It's very fascinating, Honeybee Democracy. But lately, uh, Seeley has been looking uh, to identify and follow uh, feral honeybee hives. These are bees that have escaped from domestic uh, honeybee beekeepers. And he has found some that have survived for up to seven or eight years with no varroa treatments. He is very interested in how those bees are managing that and whether or not their genetics of these feral hives could be brought back and used to improve varroa resistance in domestic bees. So he got hold of six uh, feral, feral honeybee queens from hives that have survived for uh, a number of years with no treatment. He got hold of five Russian queens from Kirk Webster, who is a treatment-free beekeeper in, in New, Northern New York. And he got hold of seven varroa sensitive hygiene Italian queens. The varroa sensitive hygiene is a line that was developed by the USDA to try to develop a resistant strain. And he established these colonies in June with very equal numbers of bees. He examined them in October and set them up. Uh, this is 18 hives uh, to uh, overwinter outdoors. He had applied no mite treatments. Uh, the winter survival was five of the six feral uh, queen hives, four of the five Russian hives, but only one out of seven of the Varroa sensitive hygiene Italian hives. That's rather striking in favor of the feral uh, treatment free bees and the Russians. The average mite counts in October, and he did do mite counts, he just didn't treat for mites. Per 300 bees were six in the wild caught. Uh, caught Queens, two for the Russians and 15 for the Italians. And the one Italian hive that survived had superseded its queen in August. And it also had the lowest mite counts of any of the seven Italian colonies. So he wondered, did the supersedure interrupt the brood rearing and limit the mites reproduction? Or did the new queen mate with some of the wild caught or Russian drones in the area and introduce varroa resistant genetics into the hive in August, which helped them to survive the following winter. Very interesting question. But this did uh, make me think a little bit more about Russian bees. Uh, it's possible if you are really eager to be a treatment-free beekeeper, you might want to look at the strains that show the greatest varroa resistance. And in this experiment, the Russians and these feral hives that have survived treatment-free for, for years had the best uh, ability to limit the mite populations and get through the winter without treatment. Uh, the Saskatraz honeybee. This is probably one of the most recent uh, strains or varieties of bees. It's the result of a breeding program, somewhat similar to the New World Carniolan breeding program at Ohio State, but this program is going on at the University of Saskatchewan. They began it just about nine years ago. They have been selecting desirable traits from a number of genetic lines, uh, honey production, disease and mite resistance, gentleness, and overwintering ability. They are selecting the uh, queens and then supplying queens to commercial breeders to propagate, and uh, then those can be sold as Saskatraz bees. And one of the large producers is Oliveris honeybees in California. Um, for a while, it was hard to get hold of Saskatraz, but they are becoming more popular. And while I don't know that our local suppliers who uh, deliver these are yet supplying Saskatraz, they are available by mail order. And so are Saskatraz queens available uh, by mail order. And I see this year Man Lake is uh, offering mail order Saskatraz um, packages. So this is an ongoing project. And I don't know that all the results are in, but uh, they're trying very hard to select for these various qualities and specifically for uh, Varroa resistance. So it may be interesting to see uh, what comes of the Saskatraz project. 
Um, there has been a great effort to breed bees that are resistant to Varroa. And in general, it has not been as successful as people had hoped. One of the speculations is that very early on in the evolution of the bees, the Eastern honeybee, the Asian honeybee separated genetically from the Western honeybee. And then the Eastern honeybee was exposed to varroa mites and they underwent natural selection and developed resistance, but that never happened to the European bees. So in order to selectively breed bees that are resistant to varroa, somewhere in their genetics, there has to be varroa resistance. Otherwise, there's just not much to be able to select there. And some people have wondered whether the fact that we've been trying for just about 20 years, maybe not quite that much, uh, 14 or 15 anyway, to develop varroa resistant varieties and haven't had a great deal of luck. There isn't any one variety that we can say is strictly varroa resistant. Maybe it's because the European honeybees really don't have that genetic trait available for selection. Um, but the efforts to create a varroa a resistant E lineage are continuing. And two of those that are commercially available, and you'll see ads for these, are the Minnesota Hygienic. That was a breeding project out of the University of Minnesota. Marla Spivak is uh, uh, also a well-known uh, national bee expert. And they were uh, selecting bees for their hygienic behavior, how quickly they will clean out uh, cells if the pupa in the cells have died, as they may if they are infested with varroa. And if the bees get in and clean out the dead pupa, they also short circuit the development of the mites in those cells. And that can be useful in uh, developing tolerance to varroa infestation. The USDA came up with the varroa sensitive hygiene or varroa sensitive hygienic bees. Um, and they were also selecting for hygienic behavior, including grooming behavior, because bees that groom themselves or groom other bees more often are likely to pick off the mites and kill them. Um, and that is another characteristic that may help bees survive the varroa mites. Um, what can you select if you want to find bees that are resistant to varroa? Well, grooming behavior. Or you can simply count the number of mites that fall off the bees, which is a sort of a, a surrogate for grooming. So looking at your sticky board, the colonies that show the greater mite fall would be the ones you would select the breed from. The hygienic behavior of rapidly cleaning dead pupa from sealed brood cells. What they did in Minnesota was use a little freezing device and they would freeze a circle of uh, cells, of, of half brood cells on the frames and then they'd watch and see how quickly the bees cleaned them out. So they deliberately killed a set of pupa and then they were able to identify those bees that did more rapid hygiene and cleaned themselves quicker. And those were the ones that they selected in their breeding program. You will see lots of folks who say that they are breeding from survivor stock. We have survivor stock and our queen bees. Well, yes, they do. If their bees died over the winter and they were non-survivors, they were not breeding them in the spring. Everyone is breeding from quote unquote survivor stock if they're breeding bees that managed to make it through the winter and they're supplying queens in the spring. The term survivor stock really to be meaningful refers to bees that have survived two winters at least without treatment. And I think reputable breeders will use that term specifically to mean that these are treatment-free bees that survived Two, two winter seasons. But boy, the term survivor stock is kind of like the word natural. You know, our, our tomatoes are natural. Well, does that, pesticides are natural. They're part of nature too, right? Uh, it's a term that doesn't have a lot of meaning. Um, but the notion that uh, you will continue to breed the bees that survive without treatment may indeed concentrate some useful genetics into the, your, your queen line. Um, there's also ankle biter bees. This was an interesting thing. This is also coming out of Ohio State. Uh, what they did was look at the mites that had fallen onto the sticky board and look for bite marks on them. And they bred bees that showed highest number of bite marks on the mites. Um, 
hope that they were selecting aggression against the mites and that those bees would be better able to survive. There's also been a trend toward uh, selecting for smaller bees. Uh, there has been a, a, an argument and a controversy over whether uh, we have selected for larger bees in the hope that we would get more honey from large bees, but small bees mature more quickly and the mites don't have as long to reproduce in the cap cells. So there have certainly been some uh, bee keepers who have argued that if we downsize our bees, and it happens that the Asian bees that are varroa resistant are smaller than the Western bees, maybe if we downsize the bees, we will inhibit the, the mites from having quite as long uh, to successfully reproduce. It may be one of the reasons that bees like to go into drone cells is the cells are larger, but also the drones take longer to mature, which gives the mother mite more time to hatch out and mature her progeny as well. Uh, so you will see that uh, some of the uh, bee keeping supply companies now offer small cell foundation uh, to folks who want to try to downsize their bees to uh, a, a set of smaller bees. Here's a little note about the ankle biter bees. Uh, this group in Ohio that is looking at the uh, bite marks on the mites and is using that as a selection. Randy Oliver uh, has a fairly large beekeeping operation in Central California. Uh, he has been selecting simply on the basis of mite counts. He measures, he, he does frequent mite counts on his hives and he breeds out of the lowest 10%, uh, those hives with the, the, and the 10% lowest counts. He noticed that the counts are quite variable. Sometimes he'll measure and it'll be low and a week later it'll be high. But in general, he's been trying to select simply, he's not entirely certain what characteristic is causing the low mite counts, but that's another way to selectively breed and hopefully over generations, if you keep selecting those with the lower counts, you will be getting some favorable genetics and some favorable behavior, which perhaps could be identified in the future. Um, there are some lines that are advertised as hybrid bees. And the term hybrid really has a different meaning in common language than it does in scientific language. In common language, people talk about hybrids, meaning that there are more than one genetic line involved. For example, uh, my ancestors came from Wales and Scotland and Ireland and Brit uh, England and Poland. And my wife's uh, ancestors came from Sweden and Norway and Finland. So I could say my kids are hybrids because they have a mixing of a number of different genetic lines. Um, and that's kind of small H hybrids. But in scientific terminology, hybrid is very specific. And it refers to a deliberate cross between two generally pure uh, breeding genetic lines. So when Mendel did his pea experiments, he had peas that had red flowers and they uniformly bred true. And he had peas that had white flowers and they uniformly bred true and he crossed them and that was a hybrid. It was an F1 or first generation hybrid. And depending on the dominance of those traits, if the red flower was dominant, all of his first generation of the cross between the red and the white came out red because they all had the dominant gene. But then if he interbred those red peas, he got some red and some white because the recessive white color trait uh, could come out in the F2, the second hybrid generation. Um, hybrids uh, sometimes show characteristics that are superior to either parent. And that was noticed even back in Darwin's time and called hybrid vigor. But there's no guarantee that a hybrid will necessarily be better than the parents. It's possible that you could make a hybrid and it would be worse than the parent. Maybe it would be small and spindly or have sour fruit. The act of hybridizing alone doesn't guarantee a better progeny, but it is often true, particularly if the parent lines have been substantially inbred, that introducing genes from two different lines will create an organism that's better adapted, and that's hybrid vigor. 
the uh, seed companies know this. And back in the 30s, they started advertising hybrid seeds, hybrid tomatoes. If you look in the Burpee catalog or Jung or um, Park, you'll see a lot of hybrid tomato seeds. And indeed, some of those hybrids may have been better than their parent progeny, but also they don't breed true. So you can't save the seed. You have to buy more seed each year from the seed supplier. And that was probably at least part of the interest in hybrids was that there was a, a marketing uh, benefit from selling hybrid seed. In the 60s, there was a little bit of a swing of the pendulum and uh, seed groups like Seed Savers Exchange, uh, which uh, people who were favored open pollinated seeds that they could save uh, seeds from and that would breed, breed true. Um, and Seeds of Change. And there uh, came an interest in heirloom uh, tomatoes, which are non-hybrid. Uh, sometimes genetic lines going back a uh, hundred years uh, and seed has been, been saved from these lines for generations. I think the very latest thing is hybridizing heirlooms. So now you can take a uh, Costoluto Genovese, say Italian paste tomato and cross it with a brandy wine heirloom tomato and you've got a genuine hybrid tomato, which supposedly will have the best qualities of both the parents. And we'll have to see if that's true or not. Um, but that does seem to be a trend right now is to get back into hybrids, but now use the heirlooms as, as the parents. So uh, when we talk about hybrid bees, sometimes we are actually talking about a true F1 hybrid that is bred from two distinct true breeding lineages of bees. And the star line and uh, the, the all-star bees were F1 generation hybrids. Uh, the hope was that they would have hybrid vigor. The problem was that as soon as those queens were superseded or as soon as they mated with the bees that were in the bee yard, they were no longer F1 hybrids anymore. Uh, and therefore, it was very hard to maintain hybrids. You would have to buy new hybrid queens every time you wished to requeen because the hybrids would not breed true um, once you had got them established in your bee yards. So uh, I believe Kona queens are still produced uh, on the island of Hawaii and they were selected for being able to survive in warm climates. So that is one uh, hybrid variety that is commercially available. I believe that the Starline and the Midnight Bees, which were popular at one time, have basically are no longer commercially available. There may be a couple of hobby beekeepers who are keeping those, those lines alive, but they are not uh, generally available. Um, the Yugo, that was a Carniolan and, and Russian hybrid that the uh, USDA uh, uh, worked on and, and released. I would not call the Buckfast bees hybrids except in a small H hybrid, meaning that they represent several different genetic lines that had been interbred and selected. Brother Adam's goal was to establish a true breeding strain of bee. He was not trying to make first or second generation hybrid bees. And the same thing, the Russian bees that were imported were interbred with European bees. Uh, so those are uh, small H hybrid bees, but they're not necessarily first generation or second generation uh, hybrids in the biological sense. Uh, Midnight and Starline at one time, uh, popular, uh, but I think not available at this time. I wanted to say a little bit about the European black or the German black bee. Uh, you would have trouble. I think you'd have to really pick the bushes to be able to find folks who are breeding these these days. But this was the bee that was brought over uh, to America by the early settlers up until about the mid 1800s the bees that were being kept in America were Apis mellifera mellifera, the European dark or European black bee. They weren't terribly good honey producers. They were have a reputation for being bad tempered, uh, but they are the bees that uh, were here in the country up until Civil War or a little later. Um, and those are the bees in many cases that got loose and became feral bees. And so now when there are feral honey bees in an area, some of those are date back to those European blacks. In the mid 1800s, there was an outbreak of European fowl brood and the black bees were not uh, resistant to it. And that increased very rapidly the popularity of Italian bees that were. 
and Italian bees were imported and bred. And basically, although they may have interbred somewhat with the existing black bees, the Italian bee by the end of the 1800s had become the dominant uh, bee in the, in the US, the dominant domestic uh, bee. Um, but the German, uh, German blacks were part of Brother Adam's breeding program. Um, and they still exist in, in Europe, and they probably, uh, could, you can find some of these genetics in wild bees here in the US. Um, this is one of the uh, theories about the way that the European bees evolved. The thought is, and there are some controversy about it, but the thought is that these bees originated in the Near East. And some bees went west, and some bees went east. The Eastern bees uh, differentiated into the Apis serenae, the Asian honeybees. The Western, the bees that moved west, ran into some geographic barriers, one of them being the Mediterranean, which is a little bit too wide for the bees to easily cross. So these bees spread out. Some of the bees went along the south border of the Mediterranean into North Africa and then uh, further into Africa. And they gave rise to what's called the A lineage, which includes African honeybees. Some of the bees went along the north shore of the Mediterranean into Italy, uh, Germany, and that's the C lineage, and that includes the Italians and the Caucasians and the Carniolans, all of them enjoying temperate climates along the north part of the Mediterranean. Some of the bees actually went into northern Europe where it's darn cold. And that included the German black bee, um, which subsequently made its way over to, to America. Uh, so here are the, the lineages, the M lineage uh, along the very northern part of Europe and Scandinavia. And that's the mellifera mellifera, the black bee and a Spanish bee, Iberica. The C lineage is the one from the northern uh, slope of the Mediterranean. And that is the ones we're very familiar with. And that should be Ligustica, not Linguistica, I misspelled that. And then there's the A lineage, the bees that went to Africa and adapted to a more tropical climate. So here again is the European black. Availability in the US is minimal as beekeepers switched to the Italian bee in the mid 1800s. But probably those genetic lines somewhat mixed over a number of decades. Um, and that means that we may not indeed, what we call Italian may not be pure Italian as you might find if you went to an isolated beekeeper in the Alps. All right, I want to say a little bit about the African honeybee. This is Apis mellifera. It's the same species as the European bees, but this is Scutellata, the variety Scutellata. This is the dreaded African killer bee. I think it actually is rather a nice looking bee. So in 1956, a bee breeder, a biologist working in Brazil was trying to create lines of bees that were better adapted to the tropical climate than the European bees were. He had European stock, but he imported uh, this African bee, Scutellata, Apis mellifera scutellata, he imported them and was crossbreeding them with his uh, European bees, hoping to get bees that would be survive near the equator. In 1957, 26 queens swarmed from his apiary and spread out into uh, the, neighboring, uh, the neighboring area. Uh, supposedly, it was a visiting beekeeper who saw that he had uh, queen excluders across the entrances to his hives. And uh, there was reason for that, but the visiting beekeeper thought that they were inhibiting the movement of the foragers in and out of the hives. So he carefully removed the queen excluders, allowing the African queens to swarm. And they took up residence and they turned out to be very, very well adapted uh, in, in the uh, environs and they started spreading through first South America, then Central America at a great rate. It was estimated that they were moving northward at the rate of two kilometers a day. Um, they mated with the European bees, which is why we say Africanized. They're not pure African line. Uh, they, they are a mixture of African genetics and European genetics. 
They were in the Amazon in the 70s. They moved up through Central America, then into Mexico. And in 1990, they had come into the southern U.S., uh, the, the southwestern states. Apparently, the northernmost expanse of Africanized bees naturally is about the Wyoming-Colorado border. We have not had a lot of problems with Africanized bees taking up residence in Wyoming. Our weather is too cold for them. Um, as it happens, the, uh, the, the biologist who was conducting these experiments was highly critical of the uh, Brazilian government at that time. And he was an internationally known speaker, went around the world and um, said, said bad things about the, about the government of Brazil. After this happened in 1957, it appears that in the Brazilian press, the African uh, queens were blamed for every stinging insect death in Brazil over a period of several years, many of which may not have been due to honeybees at all. Uh, there are wasps, there are hornets, uh, there are other stinging insects. But in the Brazilian press, this was all due to this particular professor and the fact that he had released the uh, African bees. Newsweek magazine picked up that story with a great scary uh, headline about the invading killer African bees that were marching northward and going to threaten our shores. Very similar to the murder hornet and the invasion of the murder hornet uh, through from, from the northern border. Um, and they actually followed it up a year later with another scary article showing how much farther the African bees had come. Someone said if these bees had originated in Switzerland, it would not have caused as much excitement because the Swiss killer bee just doesn't have the ring. But Africa is a dark continent full of wild, ferocious animals. And the African killer bee, that uh, made a lot of sense to a lot of people. There have actually been, I think, five different deadly bee, killer bee movies. The Deadly Bees, The Swarm, The Hive, there may be a couple of others. And in these movies, there's a sleepy little southwestern town and suddenly the sky is darkened by this massive swarm that just cloud, uh, blots out the sun. And uh, it, it swoops down on shoppers in the Piggly Wiggly parking lot and, and stings them for with no provocation and no reason and um, causes horrible death. And then the, the sheriff and the, and the pretty librarian and, and a bunch of other characters who are going to die along the, before the movie's over, they have to, to go out into the caves outside of town and, and go in and, and find and kill the queen of the killer bees in order to save the town. Um, this really resonated with a whole lot of people that uh, these uh, killer bees were coming and they were going to uh, change our way of life. Indeed, uh, African bees do have some qualities that we don't favor and they uh, are a threat in Southern uh, beekeeping and bee breeders have to be careful if they, that they don't uh, spread the African genetics uh, through their own bee breeding programs. Um, the Africanized bees are, have a reputation for aggressiveness, but that's uh, partly because they behave a little differently than we're used to with European bees. Um, they uh, take a larger area around the hive to guard. So if you are used to your Italian bees and you can take your lawnmower or your hedge trimmer and go within 20 feet of the hive and they will not be disturbed, you can't do that if you have Africanized bees in the hive. They take umbrage if you come that close. They have more guard bees. They have a larger population of bees in the hive. They uh, tend to uh, defend more aggressively and they will chase people further away. If you have bees that are challenging you and buzzing around your veil, you can turn and walk away and they typically lose interest. But the African bees have actually pursued people, had them jump in the river and they hovered around waiting for them to come up out of the water again. Um, they are very persistent, and that's a uh, useful trait when you have a very valuable store of protein and carbohydrate in the form of pupa and honey in an environment in which food resources are very limited. There are lots of predators who would like to get at the African bees' hives in their native environment, and they have learned to defend their hives against them. Uh, unfortunately, they also tend to abscond or swarm very easily. And that's probably because they have to follow water. If water dries up where they are, they move to someplace where there is water. And they have this inbred trait of being rather quick to leave their hive and seek 
uh, greener pastures. Um, they also don't store as much honey for winter. They don't have to. Um, the European bees are subject to cold winters and they have been uh, evolved to put away a good store of honey. The African bees actually prefer pollen to nectar uh, and use the protein in, in the pollen. Um, it has been uh, documented that European bee or that, that uh, African bees can invade a Western hive and install their queen, kill the queen and install their queen in the place of the European queen. But this actually happens pretty rarely. What is more common is that the African drones breed with the European queens and gradually introduce African genetics uh, into that, that line. And interestingly enough, the African bees have another uh, Apis mellifera variety, the Cape bee, which actually attacks and replaces the African bees and was thought to possibly be a biological control, but uh, that has not so far proved to be successful. But in Africa, the Cape bee will actually suppress the Scutellata, the African bee. Uh, so more defensive, more guard bees, larger populations. They are not able to, they don't put up a lot of stores, so they can't survive periods of where, where there is no pollen uh, or nectar. And that is part of the reason why they're not in Wyoming to any great extent here. They will sometimes go to ground cavities rather than tree cavities. Uh, they tend to migrate quickly when the forage runs out or water runs out. Interestingly enough, Africanized bees were introduced to Puerto Rico and there is a, a bee geneticist who works in Puerto Rico and he started doing genetic analyses on the bees. He discovered that the, the bees he was collecting were about 60% European genes and 40% African genes. But he also noticed that in a very short time, four or five years, the African bees had lost the genes that marked their aggressiveness. They had become gentle. That was partly because they were no longer competing. They're in an isolated region. They're no longer competing with other bees. So the aggressiveness is not a useful characteristic. And also the most aggressive hives were probably killed by the human residents of Puerto Rico. And so they did some degree of selection. But in a very short time, African bees isolated in Puerto Rico have lost their aggressive qualities and are hardly different than uh, European bees, which is quite interesting. So uh, in conclusion, I think almost any variety of honeybee that is commercially available has the potential to survive here in, in Wyoming and very likely will survive where you are as well. Italian honeybees are the most common variety. And if you're just starting out, they're definitely a good bet. Uh, productive, gentle, uh, you do need to uh, protect against robbing late in the year. Uh, but I think that that's a very good choice. The Russian honeybees and the Russian hybrids uh, may have greater varroa tolerance than other varieties. Minnesota hygienic and varroa sensitive hygiene variety show some varroa tolerance. Uh, the Carniolan, Saskatraz, and Russian bees have a reputation for being able to overwinter successfully, particularly in cold northern environments. But in fact, good head-to-head -head comparison data are very hard to come by. Um, and it's helpful to be able to learn about the breeders who supply the bees to your bee supplier. Uh, are, what are they selecting for? What genetic lines are they using? Um, and so it's a very good idea to ask questions about the folks who supply your supplier with uh, queens and, and packages and nukes and learn all you can about the origin uh, of those bees. And you may want to get your bees by mail. So David, thank you. Um, I, I do have some questions for you in sure. chat. And then again, uh, everybody out there, if you've got questions, this is the time to really get, get in there and ask them. You can either put them in chat or you can uh, just break in and ask. But um, so Saskatraz bees, how do they do in hot summers and cold winters? Um, a good question. Uh, I've uh, had a couple of Saskatraz hives just over the last year, so not much experience with how they do. I would expect that the cold winters, because these are being bred in Saskatchewan, Canada, 
that is very likely that they are selecting uh, bees for good uh, overwintering in harsh environments. But the hot summers, that's another question. Uh, one of the major uh, commercial breeders who gets the genetic material from the university and then propagates it is Oliveris honeybees, which is in the Central Valley in California. And it gets mighty hot uh, there. So my suspicion would be that they would do fairly well under those conditions, but I'm not sure that there have been enough Saskatraz bees in enough different environments to really have a lot of data about that. So David, this is a little off topic. <laughs> I'm often off topic. Okay. Um, when my son lived in Las Vegas, he was chased by a swarm of bees and made it into his truck just in time. Well, typically a swarm of bees is pretty benign yes. and they're easy to catch. They're, they're not going to attack and sting you and it's <laughs> pull a Hollywood horror it movie. Is, it is generally true that swarming bees do not have a hive to defend. They have no home. They are homeless. They are hanging out on a branch. One of our first year beekeepers uh, discovered a swarm on the hood of a pickup truck par parked on one of our major thoroughfares. And he had a cardboard box in his car. He had no bee suit, he had no gloves. He took the cardboard box off and began sweeping the bees off the hood of the truck into his cardboard box, and he did not get stung. He did get stopped by the police who said, you can't have your bees here, and he had to explain that he was trying to remove them uh, <laughs> and get them into a box so he could take them home. Um, however, it is said that African bees tend to be more defensive even when swarming. And that folks who are used to being able to approach swarms without a great deal of risk have been surprised that the African bees will defend the swarm, even though there's no hive, no home uh, for them to defend. So, David, um, do I need to worry about interbreeding? I'm receiving two Italians and two Saskatraz. If so, how, how far <laughs> apart do they need to be? <laughs> oh, golly, that's a, that's a tough question. The answer is yes, your bees will interbreed. Um, now, uh, what the Saskatraz uh, project has done is kind of interesting. Uh, they will send, uh, they, will, they will provide uh, genetic material. Uh, they will provide queens to a queen breeder who will propagate them. And those queens have the, let's say, 100% of the selected Saskatraz genes. And then they will sell you a Saskatraz queen. Uh, in some cases, uh, those queens have been bred by the breeder, but in some cases, those are a virgin queen. You got a virgin Saskatraz queen and installed it in your existing hive. That queen would mate with whatever male drones are around, Italians, Carniolans, Caucasians, Russians, and the next generation of bees, her sons and daughters, the daughters would be 50% of the selected Saskatraz traits, 50% of the traits of the paternal bee, the, the drone bee. Um, so they would be half Saskatraz and half Italian, let's say. But the drones come from unfertilized eggs. So the first generation, the, the sons of the Saskatraz queen are 100% Saskatraz, right? They are only maternal genetics. Now, if you were to, as soon as your Saskatraz queen has bred and produced a lot of workers who are 50-50 and a lot of drones who are 100%, if you were to introduce another Saskatraz queen, 100% Saskatraz, the drones available in th that generation would be 100% Saskatraz genes. So the F2 generation, the second generation, if you brought in a second Saskatraz queen, would highly concentrate the Saskatraz genetics. Does that make sense? All of the drones produced by your queen are have the same genetics as the queen, but the 
female bees, workers in Queen that she produces are 50-50. So you would want to replace the, the queen that she produces with another Saskatraz queen. And in doing that, you will concentrate the Saskatraz genetics. However, if you continue to raise your Saskatraz queens in a area where there are Italian drones, you're going to have your own wonder bees. There, you, may, you may come up with a very nice uh, hybrid line. How far apart do hives have to be in order to avoid having uh, drones from an undesirable hive have access to the queen? It's a long way. <laughs> Folks who are trying to control their breeding in an open breeding yard will situate uh, hives that have drone foundation in them. They will specifically try to raise hives with lots of drones, and they will put them at the 12 quarters of the compass all around the bee yard to try and saturate the area with the desirable drones. They don't want wild type drones or drones from other hives coming into their, their area. This has been a problem for Minnesota hygienics because Minnesota hygienic is a double recessive trait. And it's very easy to lose the hygienic trait if you get wild type uh, genetics, wild type drones mating with your Minnesota hygienic queens. One bee breeder was very clever. He went around, he found out where all the beekeepers in a two mile area were. And he went around and said, would you like a free Minnesota hygienic queen? And he supplied them over a course of a couple of years with hygienic queens and saturated his entire area for a couple of square miles with the desirable genetics that he was trying to breed. So even if drones from other hives got in, he had supplied them with the Minnesota hygienic and was able to keep his line relatively pure. And he was doing a public service as well. So David, Here's a, kind of a comment, but um, I'd like to hear you expand on this one. I started with Russian bees in 2007. I have never requeened. When I split each spring, I let them grow their own queens. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have only Russian uh, bees? It just all, all Carolyn says is she's got Russian bees. I would assume then if there are not feral bees in your area and there are not other beekeepers who are within a the space of a mile or so that you have been able to keep your russian line fairly pure yeah. when folks want to try to find true italian bees they do go up into the alps and look for these isolated monasteries that have bee yards that haven't been subject to the incursions of bees from other hives. Um, and surprisingly, it is possible to find some relatively uh, pure lines of Italian and Carniolan bees that would appear to not have changed too much over the last 100 or 150 years. So here's, here's a question I'm actually gonna answer for you, David. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, I'm moving on to two and a half acres and creating a homestead and orchard how many hives would you recommend so my okay. comment is is where are you doing this at what part of the country you know if it's wyoming you know you got to do a lot of planting before you can put your bees out there and <laughs> maybe i would start out with two hives right david uh you know? A very good reason for, for doing uh, two hives, unless you uh, have a, a fairly extensive orchard that you are trying to pollinate. Uh, having two hives gives you a comparison. If you have only one hive, you're not entirely sure looking at it, are my bees reproducing at the rate that I should expect? Is the colony expanding normally? If you have two hives and one hive is clearly doing better than the other, you have uh, some means of comparison there. The Bees forage over an area of, with a radius of about two, two miles. They will go far away if necessary to find nectar and pollen. That being said, here in Wyoming, pickings are pretty slim throughout an awful lot of our geography. There just is not a, there are not robust fields of alfalfa or even Canadian thistle for that matter. Um, the general rule of thumb has been one hive per quarter acre, but that is probably assuming 
a fair amount of floral resources in your area um, to really be able to uh, plant uh, for a two mile radius, you'd have to own the Ponderosa Ranch, right? Yeah, but some people true. live in more favorable environments than others, and there is more in bloom, and they can probably support a larger number of hives on a smaller area. So, David, she lives in uh, Dryden, Ontario, wow. which is midway between Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Thunder Bay, surrounded by abundant wilderness. Now, there's some interesting things with abundant wilderness in that a lot of times you'll have trees that are stressed and they have aphids ah. and aphids produce honeydew Maybe. and honeybees will go groom like the honeydew off the aphids huh? and turn it into honey. And that's actually a remarkably good tasting honey, even though it sounds a little gacky. So you might actually have more floral sources available for you than you think, but I would encourage you to build like, like you're doing to build that pollinator habitat and make sure that you've got plenty of floral resources. Flowers should be blooming from April to October, if possible, in Dryden. And, and that way you feed everybody. Is there much canola uh, planting in Dryden or around Dryden? Mm. That is a large source for nectar for Canadian bees. Yeah, that's, that's huge. I, I think the cannoli might be a little farther west, but I've only flown over that part of the world. So I was amazed at all the trees. Uh, from Samantha, there is also a lot of wildflowers, but I'm going to have to have a garden and I'm not aware of canola. So I would encourage you to um, find native plants and non-native plants in your area and, and just build a beautiful garden, build a beautiful flower garden for everybody. And then, uh, okay, David, um, what is the most appropriate time of the year to requeen hives here in Cheyenne? Oh boy, well, it kind of depends on what your goal, uh, what your goal is. Um, in general, most people believe that a really productive queen will begin to slow down on her egg laying if she tries to overwinter through two winter seasons. Now there certainly are anecdotes of folks who have had their queens for several years and several winters, but in general, it is thought that if, you, if your queen successfully overwinters the first season, you may well wish to replace her before the following winter. And that very often might be after the honey season is over, so we're talking about the early summer, early fall, for requeening that hive and getting a young, uh, hopefully more fertile, more robust queen in prior to the next winter season. Some commercial beekeepers are finding that their goal is to just keep the populations of bees up and up and up, whether you're uh, raising them to do packages uh, and, and nukes and sell them, and they may requeen four times in a season, just continually supplying a young fertile queen, hopefully to, uh, you know, keep up, keep up the egg laying. Um, so I think you probably the best thing to do is to see how your queen is faring when you inspect your hives. Are you still getting a nice full and tight brood pattern or is the brood becoming a bit spotty? Uh, is it the shotgun uh, brood? And when you see that, you have to wonder if your queen is not as fertile or is there something that is killing some of the pupae that are, were in those cap cells so that they are now empty even though they were full at one time. And those we're looking at the brood diseases. So a shotgun pattern doesn't absolutely mean an infertile queen, but that is certainly one of the considerations. If it looks to you like your queen is beginning to fail, that's obviously a good reason for, for requeening. Uh, the fall requeening in preparation for the winter is, is another one. So a question here, thinking about starting our hives near farmland, corn and soy, should I be concerned about pesticides nearby? So well, I'm going to say yes. Yes. <laughs> and the big one is going to be herbicides. 
uh, almost all the corn and almost all the soybeans are Roundup ready. And so they're going to be going after anything that flowers, weeds, whatever. They don't want any interference or contamination with their corn or soybeans. So it's going to be, um, it'll be interesting, but it has been shown that that a beehive near a soybean field actually helps increase the soybean yield. So I would get a hold of the farmer with the soybean fields and, and talk to them and see if they'll work with you. Now, corn, there is absolutely no reward of anything to bees from corn. And if bees are going after the pollen off of corn, it is famine food because there's just not that much available to them. Corn is wind pollinated. Yeah. Bees will, bees will use corn pollen in a pinch, but it's not a plant that is dependent on the bees and therefore it hasn't co-evolved to reward the bees uh, for, for pollinating. The other concern yep. with soybeans, a good deal of soybean seed, the seed itself is treated with imiclopramide or other neonicotinides, um, which then become systemic within the plant. And these are wonderful pest controls because they will kill biting and sucking insects as soon as they take a nip from the plant. But they're not necessarily good for honeybees if they are present in the pollen nectar. Yeah, so I would, I would encourage you to talk to your farmers. And right now is the best time to go talk to them, not when they're out planting the field or out there working, um, but now when they have downtime and they're really just working on their farm equipment. So now is the time to go talk to them. Don't wait, <laughs> please don't wait. And, and here's, here's a whole program. This, this question is a whole program. And, and actually, David, you've given a program on this topic. <laughs> Should I feed my bees? I've been reading a lot about it. Okay. I <laughs> talked, when I was first getting started, I talked to a more experienced old-time beekeeper who said, I don't feed the bees. That's putting the bees on welfare. It makes them lazy. They're not going to go out and collect nectar if I keep, keep feeding them. And I thought, wow, that's different than a lot that I've read. So I actually sent a question to the University of Florida Bee Lab. And I asked, is there any scientific evidence that says that supplying uh, syrup, particularly in the hive, makes bees lazy or in any way alters their foraging activity? And the response I got said, well, we don't know of a specific direct experiment that answers that question, but in our experience, what you supply to the bees in the way of syrup and protein patties is definitely inferior to what they can collect naturally. You just can't duplicate the uh, floral essences of nectar and the variety of pollen. And so if the bees have access to floral resources, they are very likely to ignore what you put in the hive. But the corollary of that is if the bees are taking the syrup and if they're clustered and gnawing on the patties, there probably are not enough floral resources for them. I believe in Wyoming, you need to start, well, first of all, you need to have enough uh, honey and, and bee bread in the hive for the winter. And that may mean that in January or February or even March, you need to get a quick peek in there and see whether you need to add some additional uh, sugar and or uh, either sugar cakes, uh, fondant, uh, even granulated sugar in order to make sure that the, your bees are going to survive the spring. The cluster is smaller. It's going to have a little more trouble generating heat. The spring days can have still very cold nights, even though the days are warm. Uh, the temperatures in the daytime may not be enough for the bees to actually fly and collect nectar and pollen. Um, so spring is a rough time uh, for the bees, even though the colonies have made it through the winter. And I could put it to a vote, but I wonder how many folks here have said, wow, my bees made it to January or they made it to February. I am so lucky and I'm such a great beekeeper. And then what happened? March and April, gee, I've got bed outs there and I don't understand it. The weather was getting better, but spring is a rough time for bees. So I think in general, it is claimed that bees cannot use syrup in the hive unless the temperature of the syrup is 50 degrees or better. 
that's not necessarily the outside temperature because the syrup, particularly if it's inside the hive or at the top of the hive, is going to be a little warmer than the outside air temperatures. But trying to put uh, syrup in the hive in the middle of winter, it may be too cold for the bees to really take advantage of, of the syrup. In the springtime, and particularly if you've put a new package or a new nuke into a, a hive, um, I think you should be feeding syrup and protein sub pollen substitute protein patties for probably a minimum of six weeks and maybe more. Some people don't like to feed syrup at the time when they are going to have honey supers on because they feel that the honey made from artificial syrup is inferior in taste and nutritional value to honey made from natural nectar. Uh, it's pretty hard to tell uh, without pretty sophisticated chemical analyses whether the bees made uh, honey from uh, the syrup that you provided, or whether they went out to get flowers, or I think in one case, uh, the honey was bright red and it was coming from the hummingbird feeder. Uh, but I would feed the bees uh, in the spring until basically you notice that they're not interested in what you have to feed them. And depending, you really need to know in your local area when your bloom times are and what is in bloom. But it's very likely as we get into the late summer, we, we have some somewhat hot summers, but not as bad as some southern states where really things dry up between spring and fall. And their best nectar flows are early and then late. I think Wyoming is a little bit more steady, but in the fall, there are relatively few things in bloom, asters, goldenrod. Um, but um, I think very likely you would want to feed in the fall in order to make sure that those bees have good reserves going into winter. So perhaps the time, perhaps the question is when not to feed, and that is in the time that you're collecting honey, assuming that you do have some floral resources in your area, and when the bees are not taking the, the uh, food that you provide. So David, a question here, uh, coming out of a comment and a question. I would love for someone to do research on natural pollen and nectar resources. I keep talking to people about that possibility, but I can't get anyone to get very interested. So there actually has been quite a bit of research done about pollen and nectar and the protein and sugar levels of those. A lot of the research has been done in the UK, and there's quite a list of pollen plants and nectar plants and what they offer back to the bees. And there's been quite a bit done here in the United States. For example, your um, Tartarian maple, uh, hot wings, does best here in Laramie County, blooms in the spring, beautiful little white um, umbrellas of flowers. And they offer about 12 to 20% protein in the pollen back to the bees, depending upon you know, the spring and the, the water content and all that other stuff. So there, there has been some research done on this. And David, do you want to expound on that? Yes, I think um, in the um, encyclopedic book, The Hive and the Honeybee, there is a chapter about pollen that grades several different kinds of pollen on the A, uh, one through four, or A through D scale. Um, and that's worth a look just to see, although you don't necessarily have too much control over plants that are providing pollen. Um, there has been a good deal of nutritional research on the amino acid contents of different pollens. And the general outcome of that is that a variety of pollen is superior to any particular single plant. That bees will uh, obtain the, the best uh, amino acid profile if they have access to multiple flowering plants rather than just one. Now that's curious because bees tend to like to go to one kind of flower when something is in bloom. And if uh, there is a good deal of clover, they will go to the clover and they will tend to ignore wildflowers growing in the same area. So the bees themselves are a little bit single-minded in picking the plants that they collect pollen from. But in generally, a broad variety of pollen and nectar sources is a pretty good guarantee that the bees will get appropriate nutrition. And yes, some pollens are more nutritious than, than others, have a higher uh, protein content. 
some nectars have a higher sugar content. But I think if we have any strategy at all, it is to provide a variety of resources insofar as we can control that by what we plant. Okay, um, well, this is a long question. Uh, I live in New Hampshire. Two years ago was my first time trying beekeeping. I started with three hives, two of which were installed successfully. The third queen didn't even make it out of the queen cage. I tried to revive the third many times that summer via brood frame transfer. And, so, uh, and though I thought I was successful with queen cells, no queen came back to that hive. The other two hives did really well, but didn't make it all the way through winter because sadly my winter cover sweated them towards the last half of the winter. I am planning on getting one Saskatraz queen and three pound package from a beekeeper who lives in New Hampshire. Do you have any tips or recommendations for me? Um, did I understand that uh, the reason that the two hives that were queen right did not make it through the winter was that you thought that your uh, wrap had trapped moisture in the hive? Was, is that the, the implication there? Chris, is that, is that what you're, Chris, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and we can chat about this. You're, you're welcome to do that. Um, but he said, uh, da, 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 da. Cover sweated them. So I, I'm assuming that since it's Connecticut, I would expect yep. the humidity to be high, so. Right, okay. So um, first question is, uh, what do you do when you've placed the queen cage? And, and I assume that you were using the delayed queen release method where you put a marshmallow or you have a little sugar plug in your queen cage. You place the queen in the queen cage in the hive and uh, the hope is that the uh, bees will gradually chew their way through the marshmallow or through the candy, and they will, they will do a timed release of the queen over a couple of days, which allows the hive to adjust to the queen scent uh, and accept that queen as their queen. When you purchase a package of bees, the worker bees, the bees and the drones that are in the package uh, did not come from the same hive as the queen in, in all likelihood. Queen came from a queen breeder. The, the bees were uh, put into the, the package from one or more hives. Um, so they have no immediate reason to accept the queen as their queen. But the notion is that by exposing the queen over a longer period of time, the bees will come to acknowledge her as their queen. If, uh, the, if the bees uh, did not accept her as the queen, they will actually kind of chew on the wires of the, uh, the beak, the, the queen cage, trying to get at her. Um, and folks who have looked at that and seen the worker bees trying to gnaw their way in say, it's a little too early to let the queen out, let's give her another day or two. But sometimes the bees do not chew their way through the uh, candy plug. And there are only limited resources available in that little queen cage for, usually has a few attendant bees in with the queen for them to feed, feed the queen. If too much time passes and the bee has not gotten out, you would have to, if she were still alive, release her manually if they're not, not releasing her. Now, in your case, your queen was dead in the queen cage and uh, ask me, you know, how I do that. I've had several cases where um, I, uh, when I was actually introducing some Saskatraz queens, uh, in the past, the queens had all gotten out within a couple of days. And so I put the Saskatraz queens in with the queen cage with the candy plug. And I said, oh, I'll, I'll check them in a week. And they'd always gotten out within two or three days previously. The other bees that I'd had went back in a week. And I think only two out of six were actually out. Fortunately, three of the remaining four were still alive and I could let them loose myself. I said, oh my gosh, I should have come back and checked this after just a couple of days. These bees are taking forever to get through that candy plug. Um, if your queen is dead, but you have live bees in your hive, uh, you have a couple of choices. You could resign yourself to having two hives and simply add the workers to the hives that are queen right, and they will have a larger workforce. 
But if your queens and your other two hives were actually beginning to lay, and you could potentially transfer a frame that had young larva, and the larva need to be probably ideally less than 24 hours old. But if you see the queen is laying eggs and the eggs are hatching and you have larva, you could transfer that frame into your queen less hive and try to see whether the worker bees there will raise some of those larva to make a queen. Uh, that may not be the ideal queen, but it is a way to get a queen into the hive, short of running out and quickly mail ordering another queen and trying to requeen the hive. If you leave the hive without a queen for too long, and how long is too long? Maybe a couple of weeks, you might very well get laying workers. There's no queen, there's no queen pheromone. The queen pheromone and the brood pheromone are what suppress the workers' ovaries so workers do not lay eggs. And in the absence of those pheromones, workers will begin to lay eggs. They can only lay infertile eggs because they have never made it. And you will get drone layers or uh, laying workers in, in the hive. And then it becomes pretty hard to requeen. Um, so one of the things you could have tried would be to, to move some uh, larva into the hive and see whether they'll raise a queen or uh, get back in touch with your, your queen supplier and see how quickly you can get another queen in a queen cage to slip into that hive to try and rescue it. Hey, David, um, again from Chris up in New Hampshire. He's, he'd like to know if in his area, New Hampshire, if Saskatraz bees would be a good idea. Well, um, I don't know that there is enough information to say that one particular breed of bees is markedly superior to another in any geographic area in the U.S. Uh, I would imagine in New Hampshire, you've got pretty cold winters, and therefore the bees that have at least the reputation for overwintering better, Russians, Cardiolans, Saskatraz, might be good choices there. Um, but my suspicion is if any of those breeds of bees are capable of surviving the winter in Canada and in Wyoming, probably they're capable of surviving the winter in New Hampshire as well. I think you might just have to make the experiment if you're interested in the uh, selected qualities in the Saskatraz bees, and it is probably the most recent selective breeding uh, university selective breeding experiment going on in North America, uh, you would have to give them a try. Okay. Well, it's uh, coming up on 8.30. Been, it's been fun. I've enjoyed this. And I'm not seeing any um, from Blake jumping in just in the nick of time. Blake, go ahead and, and unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Oh, hello, David. How are you Hi, doing? Blake. Hey, just fine. Good. I have a, my, I'm a new beekeeper, and uh, uh, I, I'm really interested in doing some research. Uh, so this is what I plan on doing. Uh, I'm going to do three horizontal hives. I'm going to put a package of Italians in there, a package of Carnolians in there, a package of Saskatraz. Uh, coming from uh, Oliveris honeybees. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I will also ha uh, have uh, a nuke of Carnolians and a nuke of Italians that I want to do a Mike Palmer uh, nuke uh, system with. Okay. And, and then I would like to get the uh, Saskatraz uh, package and put that into a mini nuke, a deep with it sectioned in four places, and mm -hmm. pick up three other queens. And so uh, uh, let me just explain to folks, um, and, and uh, let me see if I have this right as well. Mike Palmer uh, was a commercial uh, beekeeper who uh, discovered that uh, although his production hives, the hives that he was using to for both for pollination but also for honey production, um, it was somewhat challenging for him to be able to uh, overwinter a large number of full-size hives. 
Now, at the time, and this is probably 20 years ago, maybe even a little more, people doubted that you could overwinter a nuke. A nuke is a half-size hive with maybe five um, frames in it. And I believe Mike actually did some double nukes, which had 10 frames, but they were five and five well, stacked on top of each other. And he demonstrated uh, in the Northeast, where winters are pretty cold, that he could actually overwinter bees in his nucleus hives. And that had several advantages. In the spring, he had uh, surviving queens in about five frame hives, and they were uh, producing and filling those hives pretty quickly. So he could go through and harvest frames of bees out of his nucleus hives and use them to strengthen his productive hives. Also, if his productive hives had a non-productive queen, he had an easy resource for raising queens through his nukes. And I believe the first uh, year or two he tried it, he had about 50 nukes that he overwintered. Um, and then he used them. He uh, mentioned things like if he had a weak production hive that didn't seem to be thriving, he would take two frames of brood from each of five nukes, making a 10 frames of brood, and he would add a 10 frame brood box underneath the non-productive hive. And this just exploded the population of bees in that hive. And his, some of his less productive hives became his most productive hives after giving them a population bomb of that sort. So he has a whole system involved in using his nucleus hives as supports or the full-size production hives, and also using them to overwinter a larger number of colonies without having to have full-sized hives for all his colonies and getting uh, them through the winter, even with winter losses. If he uh, has a couple of nukes for each production hive, he's got three times the number of, of hives to overwinter. He can afford some losses and still come out in the spring with a lot of bees. So you're hoping to do that now. Are your uh, hives going to be separated? Because if not, you're going to have a wonderful hybrid of Saskatraz, Italian, and Carniola, not to mention Russians. <laughs> right. It could, I'm, be that, I'm it could be that you will have the greatest hybrid bees around, but uh, unless your, your hives are pretty geographically separated, the drones from one hive are going to be mating with the uh, queens that any other hive might produce. If your queen is superseded during the year, uh, what you're going to get is very likely to be a mixture of genetic genetic lines. Not to say that's right. bad, but they would not be I, true. I, I'm, I'm willing to uh, take that risk. I'm living on about a two acre property in a mm -hmm. rural area that okay. is surrounded by agricultural uh, fields in Idaho Falls in Idaho. So the and, question uh, would be, are the fields being sprayed? And if so, when? That's one, one right. thing. If you're relying on your neighbor's uh, agricultural production, you'd like to know something about their management uh, techniques and that they are favorable to bees. Correct. Is there, uh, and, and I'm also picking up uh, uh, two nukes, uh, a little bit bigger than nukes. They're coming uh, in seven frames that are uh, right. uh, built out, uh, but I'm getting two of those from about five miles from my residence. So ah. I plan on having a, a, a well-rounded group of bees and uh, I'm probably going to keep them uh, all within a half acre lot. Uh, okay. Would well, I put, what are your suggestions? Um, I think you will need to pay pretty close attention to your nukes because they can become overcrowded and swarm pretty quickly, right. particularly if you have a nice fertile queen in a small, small hive. So Correct. part of your management is going to be to prevent the nukes from swarming. And very often that means you're gonna be shuffling frames of, of bees back and forth among your hives. I kind of doubt in your situation that you are going to be able to maintain the line of your Italians and your Carniolans and your Saskatraz bees separate from one another. Because right. it's a part of your management technique is going to be moving frames of bees from hive to hive where they are needed. And also to be able to create space in your nukes so that the, those, those hives do not swarm. Right. Uh, so, that makes sense. And, and Mike Palmer and uh, Kirk uh, Webster, 
have written pretty extensively. I think now um, Megan Milbreth has also written about the systems of using nukes as an adjunct to, to your production. You'll probably want to look at some of that online. I know uh, Kirk uh, did a talk for the British National Honey Show probably about six, seven years ago now, talking about the sustainable apiary. And you can look on YouTube under sustainable apiary and uh, quite a good talk about how he manages his combination of full-size hives and nukes. Well, thank you so much. All right, well, good luck. You're fairly ambitious. Uh, there was a fairly recent article um, of a beekeeper, I believe in the Northeast, uh, who was using horizontal hives. And he put up eight horizontal hives with inch and a half insulation around the hives. He had not previously insulated his hives. And he had only one overwintering year's experience, but the bees used about half of the amount of honey and pollen when he had that inch and a half of um, extruded, what is it? Uh, it's, it's not, I can't say styrofoam. You're not supposed to say styrofoam, but extruded polystyrene. <laughs> it's the pink block insulation. And he had right. designed these horizontal hives so that they were well insulated he leaves the insulation on year round, so they're cooler in the summer, warmer in the winter, and uh, they uh, seem to fare better in the winter and use considerably less stores. So for horizontal right. hive keepers, that's a very interesting, uh, very small, single season experiment. I, I will be using uh, Dr. Leo Shashrinkin's uh, horizontal hive that's insulated with uh, yes. uh, wool, and th right. it's going to be a lay inside. Yeah, yeah, a Lance Hive, and uh, his right. his website is horizontalhive.com, I believe. If you're interested yes, in the Lance Hive and in uh, natural and treatment-free beekeeping, uh, Leo is a great resource. Thank you. Catherine, could I make a comment? Go for it, Paul. This is Paul Dexter. I'm in uh, near Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, I'm in my third year of beekeeping, and I've had two successful winters of uh, getting my bees through the winter. Uh, we, when we talk about insulating, I have been so tempted so many times to wrap my hives in straw or, uh, or the polystyrene foam insulation and things like that. Uh, but it's important from what I've learned and experienced now that you've got to keep your hives ventilated even though there's cold air coming in and going out, uh, a wet hive will end up just in a gigantic ball of frozen bees if you don't keep it ventilated. So um, I basically all I do is put up a windbreak to keep the cold air from the north and uh, northwest coming in. And I have uh, been successful doing that. Um, so, and I've been tempted, as I said, put, putting up that polystyrene insulation and I'm and I'm not surprised to hear that on a, on a horizontal hive that that can be effective but uh, anyway I just want to throw that out from my own personal experience. I have a talk that I've given on uh, uh, myths and misconceptions of the winter hive and I have to say that the debate between insulation and ventilation is an ongoing lively controversy. <laughs> Um, yeah, yes, with, I would agree. With, with national experts weighing in on both sides with data, which makes it very confusing for those of us who are trying to figure out uh, what, what we can do. Right. Um, there is a great tradition that I think comes out of British beekeeping, and certainly the British climate is, in many places, somewhat milder than the northern U.S., uh, but also very damp. Um, and uh, British beekeepers kept bees in straw hives for a long time until mid 1800s. And those hives breathed very well. They were not at all used to seeing moisture accumulating in their hives. And there are actually some interesting comments in uh, the late 18, or mid 1800s when wooden hives became commercially available. Some of the British beekeepers did not like them at all. They did not breathe, they accumulated moisture, they complained that hives made of wood were inferior to straw hives. One manufacturer even made their hive out of compressed straw, trying to make a breathable hive that nonetheless had a flat, solid side and not the braided straw step. So um, there is this ongoing issue of uh, if you insulate the hive, uh, the goal would be to retain heat and therefore 
uh, make fewer metabolic demands on the cluster of bees. Is that true? That's question number one. Does insulation, in fact, reduce uh, the metabolic demand from the bees? And then the downside would be, does it cause moisture accumulation in the hive that is harmful to the bees? Um, for ventilation, uh, this is to re re reduce the moisture in the hive. But the question is, does it cause heat loss that is harmful to the bees? Um, I do not think these questions have been answered on a scientific basis yet. There are some things that you can do that actually kind of benefit both sides of the equation. I think there's no question that insulating your telescoping cover is a very good thing. Uh, the most of the heat that escapes from the hive escapes through the three quarter inch pine and a little metal fascia on your uh, insulated or on your telescoping cover. You'll see pictures of winter hives in which there's a, a melted snow in a circle at the top of the hive <laughs> um, because that's where the heat is getting out. So if you want to retain heat without necessarily changing the moisture content very well, insulating the top of your hive is a very good idea. Having a quilt box, uh, which absorbs moisture, but also provides insulation. Very good idea. Uh, Abbe Worre's Worre design uses a quilt box and the roof over the quilt box is very airy, very open, lots of, lots of gaps in it so that moisture in the shavings or wool or the organic material in the insulating box will evaporate at the top. So here's a way to provide insulation, but also avoid condensation uh, in the hive. Yes, um, I, do, do we, I do that. Do we need to provide I, I more that, ventilation yeah. by making a hole in the upper part of the hive? Yeah, it definitely has its advocates, although it also has its detractors. Uh, Derek Mitchell is a, a graduate student in air conditioning and heating, and he thinks that it's crazy to put a hole in the top of your hive and let the warm air uh, out that way, but that is uh, time honored uh, among many, many uh, beekeepers, both in the U.S. and uh, in Britain. So I don't think we've heard the last word yet about the balance between uh, insulation or ventilation. If you can uh, place your bees in a temperature and humidity controlled environment over the winter, well, well, great, but often our indoor environments are too warm yeah. uh, and that's not good for the bees. Uh, if you place an individual hive heater and have a thermostatic control, such as a grow mat for a uh, greenhouse uh, for plants or even a incandescent light bulb with some sort of a thermostat uh, on it, that potentially helps to solve both problems because it prevents, it, it adds heat to the hive, but it also expels moisture. Now, there are some things that meet both requirements, but trying to find the balance between insulation and ventilation, I don't know what that is. Thank you very much. So I have a request to everybody out there and my, my Wyoming Bee College conference program is really driven by your requests. And so what do you want to learn? What, what topics are of interest to you? If you have any suggestions on them, go ahead and put them in chat or you can email me either way. Um, but I would love to hear back from you on, on what you're looking for to learn. And David, as always, you are a wealth of information and knowledge on beekeeping and it just amazes me. Um, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's never, never dull, never well, dull. Thank you all for checking in. And I hope that you continue as these programs go on through the rest of February and, uh, on March 20th, um, we've got some really interesting speakers lined up and it's great to see this degree of interest from all over the place. Uh, really nice. Thank you for, uh, attending. Thanks doc. Appreciate it. Thanks, Catherine. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. All right. Well, everybody, um, God, thank you. You're a great group tonight and loved having you. And I look forward to seeing you in the next programs that are coming up. Uh, I put into chat where you can find this recording, and it'll be at the Laramie County Extension website under Ag and Horticulture. And so you can go back and review this at your leisure. So again, everybody, thank you. And 
I appreciate all the comments coming in and I will take everything into consideration when I'm looking for my speakers and topics. So thank you all. David, again, thank you very much. Everybody have a great evening and um, good night, everybody. Stay safe and stay warm. <laughs>